I am really excited to be here. One, because it's been a while since I've been able to go out um, to some of our facilities with COVID and everything. But, and this is something that I told the staff earlier today, but I love coming here because this, this place, Endangered Wolf Center, and if you include you know, the St. Louis Zoo as well, is really the mecca of Mexican wolf recovery. I know we all think about these animals going out into the wild in Arizona and New Mexico and Mexico, um, but <clears throat> a lot of the work that was done in order to get to that place has really been done here at this facility specifically, um, as well as with the partners with St. Louis Zoo. Our pup fostering program essentially was kind of our ability to do that, to be able to pull puppies from captivity and release them into wild dens really started because this facility helped us make it possible. And I can, I can go back in so many different examples and talk about how this facility made something possible, right? Like when we first started, not when we first started, but after reintroducing wolves for even 10 years, almost every wolf in the wild population could trace their ancestry back to this facility. Not just our captive breeding program, right? But this facility in particular. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk more about it, or I'll try to talk more about it on some of the slides too, but this facility has been really important in de helping develop our gamete um, collection and the use of artificial insemination, which is hopefully somewhere we're going to be able to go uh, in the future pretty aggressively. Um, so anyway, I, I, I don't want to keep, I feel bad because I do get to say like, this is the most important facility that I have. Um, <laughs> yeah, so can I start this over? Um, <clears throat> that's what, that's, this is the cone of silence, right? That doesn't, that doesn't leave this room, but it is, I do want people to know. And I, as I mentioned to the staff today, I think not seeing outside the bubble that, you know, folks here may not recognize how important this facility really is to overall recovery of the species. Um, so starting with that, Mexican wolf recovery, it's a huge program. And it is impossible to give a one hour presentation on it and have everybody leave the room feeling like they know kind of the ins and outs of the whole program. I could probably give four one hour presentations and maybe get people to that point. I feel like, you know, the title of this talk is Back from the Brink and I feel like I can make Mexican wolf recovery sound really exciting, like a, like a promotion for a movie, right? Like, uh, you know, come join me on this exciting adventure from persecution to recovery, you know, fraught with litigation and scandal, you know, because we all want to believe that Mexico or wolves mate for life, but they really don't. Um, and, you know, and from going from seven animals, uh, super close to extinction to now more than 600 globally, like what a great story being told under the Endangered Species Act, but, you know, not everybody wants it to succeed. You can talk about wolf recovery and make it sound really exciting. Um, Unfortunately, I stand up here representing that second square there, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is a federal agency. So I represent the federal government and nothing in bureaucracy is ever that fun. Um, so like everybody else, I have to start my presentation with thanking our partners. And we have thousands of them. This is a very small representation of them, actually. Um, Department of Interior and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that's who I work for. We are the agency that's ultimately responsible for recovering species that are listed as endangered. We have USDA's Forest Service, Wildlife Services, Arizona and New Mexico state game agencies. White Mountain Apache Tribe is a very large reservation in our recovery area, their partners. We have our partners in Mexico with Semernat and Conap, and of course AZA and Mexican Wolf Species Survival Plan soon to be safe. Um, and then of course, lots and lots of other partners, um, like University of Idaho does our genetics. We have tons of, you know, if I, if I put them all on here, we'd be here all night. Um, but <clears throat> I get to tone down how excited I can make Mexican wolf recovery because I am a federal biologist, but I do believe in my heart of hearts that we are getting very close to being, you know, one of the greatest success stories that the Endangered Species Act is leading. So I find it really exciting. Um, this is normally my slide on what is a Mexican wolf. I think everybody in this room knows that Mexican wolf is the southernmost occurring, most genetically extinct subspecies of gray wolf. Um, this may only come up in conversation at the end because it did come up earlier today. The reason um, why kind of this subspecies, you'll hear me say subspecies a lot is important is we, Mexican wolves were listed under the gray wolf listing um, but in 2015, we listed it separately as a subspecies. Part, part of that was because we were 
starting our wonderful tour of delisting and listing the gray wolf repeatedly, and we didn't want the Mexican wolf going with it. So Mexican wolf now is listed as a subspecies, and the importance of that in conversation later might just be that the historical range of Mexican wolf is kind of widely debated in the scientific community, just the northern boundary of it, right? So where subspecies met, they interbred, so it wasn't like this line on a map that you could say Mexican wolves were here and Canis lupus nubilis was here. Um, it was a fuzzy gray line. But when you list something as a subspecies and then you put it, uh, you reintroduce it to the wild under section 10, you have to put a line on the map of where that, that species range is because we can only reintroduce species into their historical range unless the historical range is significantly altered or destroyed. So that's why when you hear us talk about You'll see it later in the presentation, you know, Interstate 40 and why we have this hard line at Interstate 40. We had to draw a line somewhere, so that's, that's, why, that's why that line exists. So that may come up later in the conversation, especially if somebody asks about Colorado. Don't ask about Colorado. No. I think this slide is redundant, too. I think we're all familiar with why <laughs> wolves um, almost everywhere went extinct, but settlers moved west. They brought with them their livestock. The livestock outcompeted the native ungulate herds. Wolves and other predators turned to cattle as their food source. Conflict arose, people don't like that. And so there was a government-led anti-predator anti -predator campaign in the mid-1800s through the early 1900s that tried to get rid of all wolves and bears and lions and tigers, oh my. Um, but unfortunately for wolves, it was really successful and the last Mexican wolf was killed in the United States around 1970. Um, <clears throat> ironically, the Endangered Species Act came around in 1973, and Mexican wolves were listed in 1976. So those very same governments that were trying so hard to get rid of, all predators are now being charged with trying to restore and recover Mexican wolf. Um, again, there were none left in the United States, so through a binational effort with Mexico, we went into Mexico and caught some of the last remaining wild wolves and started a captive breeding population, and as you guys know, became dangerously close to extinction. There were only seven founders for the entire global population. Um, <clears throat> in 1982, the Fish and Wildlife Service wrote a recovery plan, as we do for all listed species. And recovery plans are supposed to include downlisting and delisting criteria. Statutorily, it's required that they include that, actually. And that recovery team at the time thought the situation was so dire for Mexican wolves that they couldn't foresee recovery. Those words are actually in the recovery plan, that this situation is so dire we can't foresee recovery. So instead of recovery criteria, it said, basically, good luck. If you can grow a captive population, great. And if you could maybe reintroduce some of those to the wild and they do OK, great. And if you can do both of those things, then go back and write a recovery plan. Otherwise, we can't even envision what that looks like. Um, so pretty, pretty terrible conditions um, at the time. And luckily, the captive managed care um, was really successful in growing a captive population of Mexican wolves. It, it was a lot easier than we thought it was going to be. It wasn't easy, but it was a lot easier than we thought it was going to be. And for the next 15 years, the Fish and Wildlife Service then saw, OK, well, we, we got the first part to work. We know we're able to grow these animals in captivity. So they tried to come up with a vision for what reintroduction to the wild could look like. Um, <clears throat> in 1998, we published a 10J rule. Does everybody know what it, when I say 10J, what that means? It's under Section 10 of the Endangered Species Act. It's just basically how we reintroduce an endangered species without all of the, not without, but with some reduced uh, regulations associated with it. So with an endangered species, you can't haze it or trap it or move it. You can't harm it in any way, but Section 10 allows us some freedom and flexibility to manage the animals once they're released. Um, so this rule said that we could release wolves into this primary recovery zone. They could disperse into and occupy this area, but they couldn't go outside of it. Don't worry about the other lines. They're meaningless at this point. But they couldn't go outside of it. Um, so in 1998, we took 11, in March of 1998, we took 11 wolves. We plopped them down in the primary recovery zone in three different family groups. And we celebrated because the howl of the Mexican wolf could once again be heard in the Southwest you know, for the first time in maybe 30 years. And it was fantastic. And that celebration was quickly dampened because at the end of the year, only two of those 11 wolves were still alive. And we realized then that we had a ton to learn. Um, <clears throat> 
some of it was our fault. One of the things we learned is that Mexican wolves were going to prey primarily on elk. We assumed because of their smaller body size that they would eat mostly deer. And so once we realized that they were preying primarily on elk, we were like, well, let's move their release sites up into the more northern elevations, the more elk driven ecosystems. And we saw a lot more success with those releases. Um, another thing we learned is that releases for us were more successful if you released a, an adult pair with young pups. Um, some of these things, when you look in hindsight, you're like, Duh. So we put a lot of work into where we want these wolves to be, right? Wolves and people, a little challenging. And so we would you know, put a lot of work into, we want a pack to establish here. And when we'd release adult wolves here, they wouldn't stay here. You know, and so when we released them with four to eight week old puppies, those puppies can't move off very much, right? So the adults would stay with the puppies. And once the puppies were old enough to move off, the pack had been there for you know, a couple months. And by and large, they usually made it their territory. So we had more success once we figured out kind of a release methodology that worked for us. Um, <clears throat> we also learned that establishing naive wolves, like naive being captive born, you know, on the landscape was really, really hard and required a lot of work. It wasn't like you could just put them down and say like, good job to us. You can see in the first couple years, um, the number of releases is high. You're releasing 20 wolves in a year or you know, around that for a couple years. That's a, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of animals going out the door. Um, we were also doing a lot of removals, that yellow line. And removals includes not just removing an animal from the wild, but moving it to a new area. Like if it's in trouble over here, getting into conflict, we'd pick it up and move it. But it was heavy kind of put and take those first few years. Um, <clears throat> and then you can see towards the, once we started learning some of those things, moving the release sites, releasing my pups, you can see that the population starts to grow and releases and removals kind of somewhat stabilizes or you know, becomes more manageable. And I'm not kidding, in 2003, we thought we had made it. We were like, we are the next Yellowstone. Like, look at us go. Like, it only took us a couple years, and we're going to walk away. And boy, that didn't happen. Um, <clears throat> we got really confident, right? Because we have honestly thought, like, we had the example of Yellowstone, really, that we thought we were kind of modeling. Yellowstone is a bit like taking kids to Disney, or the reintroduction into Yellowstone. Don't tell my friends. And, the Northern Rockies this, but taking wild wolves from Canada and putting them in the Yellowstone is like taking a kid to Disneyland and thinking, I wonder if they'll have fun. You know, like those wolves were gonna thrive no matter what we did. And so, but we thought we were there, right? We thought, yeah, we're, we're the next Yellowstone, we got this. Um, so we developed a standard operating procedure protocol um, that said any wolf that kills three cows in a year is gonna get removed from the wild. Cause we, the wolves and cows are the reason we don't have wolves in the, the landscape today, so let's, let's manage this aggressively. And you can see that removals stayed really high because we were managing aggressively for wolves that were coming into conflict with livestock, and we stopped doing releases, essentially stopped doing releases. And the population responded accordingly, like look at that. We oscillated between 40 and 60 wolves for eight years, right? Um, <clears throat> and it's, again, one of those things in hindsight if your population is 45 one year and the next year you're removing 20 wolves from the wild, I don't know why you would expect this to go up, right? We did because we thought we were the next Yellowstone. Um, clearly we weren't. And so we knew at the end of this time period that we needed to change. But once we made a commitment to manage aggressively against depredations or against, you know, aggressively for wolves that were coming into conflicts with livestock, we couldn't take that away. We couldn't say, you know what, never mind, we're not going to remove wolves when they kill your cows. Right? Like we had to replace it with something else. You can't just take something like that away. We had to replace it with something else. Thank goodness. Um, and what we did is we tried to become proactive versus reactive, right? Instead of removing wolves once they get into conflict with livestock, we started putting a lot more energy in trying to prevent the depredations from happening in the first place. Another kind of dumb moment, right? But, um, <clears throat> and I will, will actually stop here for a second because I think it's important. We do focus a lot on the the subject of conflict with livestock, um, but 80% of the Mexican wolf's diet is elk. So 80% of what they're eating out there is elk. Cattle is like 10, 15%. It's higher in some areas where there's more conflict. It's lower in other areas. But it is important, you know, as I stand here and talk a lot about cattle, that the majority of what they're eating is elk. 
But the wolf livestock kind of conflict or whatever is centuries old and it's really, really ingrained in the culture, right? I mean, it honestly is why we got rid of wolves in the first place and people's perception of wolves really matters. And so we spend the bulk of our field work managing this kind of wolf livestock scenario, um, even though, you know, when you hear me say 80% of their diet is elk, you think like, well, why, why are we trying so hard? But um, <clears throat> It is, it is a big important part of our program and it is this shift from being reactive to proactive is a, is a big reason why we're getting to the, where we are today. Um, what I mean by proactive management activities, um, how do I wanna describe this? So <clears throat> when wolves and we, we really only have cattle, we don't have a ton of sheep or goats in our recovery, thankfully in our recovery area. Um, so I say livestock, but I do mostly mean cattle. When wolves and livestock coexist, cohabitate, live in the same place, um, the opportunity for conflict is there, right? And we have the unfortunate situation, unfortunate for wolves, um, that we have year-round grazing and year-round calving. A lot of other places where wolves live, there's seasonal grazing, so it gets really cold and the cattle get pulled off the you know big public grazing allotments for winter or whatever and so they have they have seasons of depredation we have opportunity for conflict year-round and we have the bigger challenge is that we have year-round calving so calves are a lot more vulnerable to predation right so we have opportunity for conflict all the time it's really exhausting um, <laughs> but what we want to try to do is try to separate wolves and cattle kind of in time and space if we can um, so ranchers that are willing to pull their cattle into a smaller pasture that's more protectable for them to calve uh, will offer to purchase hay and supplements so that they can, they can feed them while they're there. Um, if they can't do that, uh, we, during the denning season, denning season is problematic because wolves are stuck to a hole in the ground and they're not going to go spend the whole day hunting this giant territory that they have, right? They're going to want to eat what's closest to them. And if that's cows, that's when we get into trouble. And so we spend, during denning season, once the wolves den, we'll meet with the Forest Service and we'll look at the different pasture rotations of the cattle operations and when they're calving, et cetera. And so we'll try to keep cows as far away from the dens as possible without altering the ranchers' you know, practices at all other than their cows are gonna be in this pasture instead of this one for certain months. And certainly when they have calves, we want those as far away from the dens as possible. So Forest Service works with us to try to you know, move the, instead of removing wolves, we're now moving cattle around in places they were already gonna move, just maybe in a different pattern. Um, <clears throat> range riders is sort of the romantic idea of the cowboy out riding the herd, right? We'll, we'll hire range riders to go out there and anytime wolves and cattle need to share a water source or any kind of space, they'll, they're out there hazing the wolves or moving the cat, you know, taking the cattle down to the water and then moving them away from it. Um, we purchase and loan telemetry equipment. So the radio receivers, you know, the wolves are wearing radio collars and these are the receivers. So a rancher can wake up in the morning, turn on the receiver. And if they don't hear wolves, they can go about their day. If they do hear wolves, they might go do something different that day. Um, Fladry, I think we all know about. And diversionary food caches are something that um, our program started and it's worked out really well for us in, in places where we can't get any kind of time and space separation and we know there's gonna be conflict or we're experiencing conflict. Um, this is a food cache here. We'll provide sort of a supplemental meal to the packs, right? So once or twice a week, we'll go out and dump a roadkill elk or these carnivore logs. Um, to the pack, and it's not really for any kind of supplemental reason, any, like sustenance reason, it's more that it just reduces that pack's need to prey for a short period of time, to predate on something for a short period of time so that maybe the calves can get a little older and a little bit more agile, you know, before the, we stop feeding the wolves and then they go out and hopefully kill less cows. Um, but that's been really successful for our program. Um, <clears throat> Between our program and the states and other NGOs and rancher in-kind services, like if they agree to move their cows to another pasture, that costs money. Um, we spend about $700,000 a year doing this kind of proactive stuff. It's a, it's a lot of money. That includes like staff salary and stuff, so it's not, it's not all dollars and cents. But um, <clears throat> it's a lot of work, and that doesn't include about the 
three hundred. I think it's on the next slide, actually. The three hundred thousand dollars a year we spend on compensation. So if if cows are killed by wolves, that rancher will get compensated for that that lost animal or that the death of that animal. Um, so the question after that is always, where does that money come from? Um, the bulk of the funding so far has come from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we offer a grant, it's a national grant, so to all el eligible states and tribes, um, a grant that is, you can apply for money for compensation, so to pay for dead cows, or for prevention efforts. Arizona, last, the last award was in 2021. Arizona got $370,000, New Mexico applied for and received $210,000. The great thing about this grant, well, it's tough for the applicants, but the great thing about this grant is that it requires a one-to-one -one non federal match. So Arizona has to go out and find 300, and, sorry, I'm doing really bad math, $270,000, um, <clears> you know, of non federal money to match this funding. And same with New Mexico. But I think one of the more awesome things about this that to me at least shows some progressive thinking is that both states match the compensation grant and prevention grant with prevention money. So Arizona is not finding another $120,000 that they're paying out in compensation. They're finding another $120,000 that they're putting towards prevention efforts. So it's, it's nice that the idea is kind of moving away from same idea from our program, right? Moving away from compensating as much as moving towards preventing. So, um, <clears throat> and voila, what we saw is this proactive versus reactive thing works, right? We, we, st we aren't removing as many wolves um, because we have this proactive plan and we're still not releasing any wolves and the population started growing uh, or grew really well on its own just from that. Um, <clears throat> so that brings us to, in 2015, we entered phase four, one, two, three, four, um, of Mexican wolf recovery. And in 2015, we decided that Mexican wolves needed a bigger playground. So our original recovery area had the little tiny place we could release wolves and they could go into this area, but they couldn't go outside of it. And now, as starting in 2015, the pink area becomes where we can release wolves from captivity. This color is that gray gray area they can disperse into and occupy they can also disperse into and occupy this green area but there's not a lot of habitat out there so if they do go out there and they start getting into trouble with something we, we'd be more aggressive in managing them but starting in 2015 wolves went from being able to be in this tiny little area to anywhere below interstate 70 70 40, i wish interstate 40. <clears throat> um so also in 2017, um, we published a new recovery plan. In 2000, in November, on November 29th of 2017, we were still operating on the 1982 recovery plan that said, just try, good luck. And so on November 30th of 2017, we published a new recovery plan that actually contains downlisting and delisting criteria and a vision for Mexican wolf recovery. So it, it only took us almost 20 years to figure that out. <clears throat> Um, oh, I thought this had both criteria. So our recovery plan aims for basically greater than 320 wolves in the U.S. population, that map I just showed of um, our recovery area, and greater than 200 wolves in a population in Mexico. <clears throat> um, it also, and I thought the second bullet had this, but it also has uh, criteria for how many wolves released from the captive population need to survive to breeding age in the wild population, right? So it's not just an abundance criteria, it also has a genetics criteria associated with it. And you can see that we're, <clears throat> last year our population was at 196, almost 200, and Mexico, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> in last year was about 40 and they're about the same we're doing our we're conducting our annual population survey now and through the end of january so that thing is getting close to me isn't it <laughs> <clears throat> i see you guys looking at the bug um <clears throat> i don't know what's next oh i do know what's next this is the last time you're going to see this slide who's happy just kidding i was putting this together i'm like this is ridiculous that this is all in one slide all right so you can see the first three phases of recovery, and now in 2015 we published the new rule, and now our population from 2009 until now has had this really great healthy growth trajectory, pretty excited. One of the things that kind of marks 
why this is a new phase is you'll see removals kind of are doing what they're doing, but we're starting to release wolves again, which is great. Um, <clears throat> but we're not releasing wolves because we need this line to go up. We're not releasing wolves for the purpose of trying to get the population to grow. It's doing that on its own, thankfully. It's doing that on its own. We're releasing wolves because we have a serious genetics problem. Um, <clears throat> I could talk about this for hours, so roll your eyes if I, I'm gonna try to go through fast through this because I do want to have a more engaging conversation. So we have seven founders. Um, <clears throat> Three of them came out of the wild from Mexico. Four of them were in two different captive populations. It's not really that important. Um, I mean, it is important, but it's not that critical to what I'm about to say. But the thing is, is we weren't sure of the genetic purity of the, the captive, the ones that were being managed in captivity at that time. And genetic tests were not what they are today. We brought those wolves in from the wild around the you know, 1977 to 1980, and it took us until 1995 to be able to confirm that all the wolves that we were managing in captivity were pure. So from 80 to 95, those three lineages of wolves were all managed separately. So in, we talk about having seven founders, but for those first 15 years we had the wild wolves from Mexico had three founders, the captive wolves in Mexico had two founders, and the captive wolves in the United States had two founders. And they, they bred only within their lines. And so we lost a lot of gene diversity in those first 15 years. Um, the current captive pop, and then once we figured out they were all pure, we started breeding them back and forth, and we really slowed the loss of gene diversity then. But the current captive population maintains about 83% of the genetic diversity of those seven founders. So that's how much gene diversity we lost, right? Um, and then to make matters worse, I shouldn't say it that way. And then the wild population, when we established it, you know, if you go back to my slide, we got to a point where we weren't releasing wolves anymore. And so the wolves that we put out on the landscape, because we weren't sure it was going to work, right, they were genetically redundant to the captive population. So they were surplus in captivity. We put them out in the wild. And voila, they did well. And so the, cap the wild population was established with only a subset of the gene diversity that's available in the captive population. And the captive population already only has a subset of the founding, the seven founders. So we, like, we're stepping it down, we're making it worse, right? So we really need to continue releasing wolves to the wild population because there's genetic diversity available in captivity that's not represented in the wild. And when you only have seven founders, you can't do that, right? You don't have the luxury of just taking some of them. I think that conservation planning, breeding planning specialist group talks about if, you know, the minimum number of founders for a population that's required, the minimum required founders is like, I think it's 15, and that's the lowest bar you should ever have. So we're, we're struggling. This is an issue even if everything was great and everything is not great. So <clears throat> we do need to keep releasing wolves um, to the wild so that we could help augment, the, give the wild wolves the best chance they have. And unfortunately, because everything in wolf recovery has to be hard, um, people don't want us to release wolves. I can't believe it. Um, <clears throat> but so it's really hard to get support to release. I'm sure you guys are familiar with what the Red Wolf program's going through, what we've gone through, but we don't have a lot of support for releasing wolves. Um, and I do, kind of similar to pointing out that 80% of the diet is elk, even though we talk about cows a lot, um, <clears throat> releasing adult wolves, it does work, right? There's a reason why red wolves were established. There's a reason why red wolves are trying to reestablish. There's a reason we have a Mexican wolf population on the ground because releasing adult wolves from captivity does work. You can establish a population in the wild by releasing adult wolves. But the challenges associated with it do have merit, right? 40% of the nuisance behavior that we document in our wild population is from those animals that have been released from captivity. And again, people's perception, people's experience with wolves really matters. And <clears throat> one of the tough parts about releasing adult wolves is these are you know, animals that have never had any wild experience and we have a whole bunch of animals, wild animals now, like wild born wild animals, and wolves live in territories. And so we can't put, you know, the two wolves from here inside another wolf's territory and say like, I hope, I hope you do okay, you know. Um, <clears throat> it requires new territories, new unoccupied wolf areas to release wolves. And the situation that we have right now is that our kind of 
core area where wolves are is pretty densely occupied by wolves. And so if we were to release an adult pair, we would have to go to a space that doesn't have wolves. And those spaces right now for us have never had wolves. And so in that situation, we'd be taking naive wolves that are prone to nuisance behavior and putting them on the ground near stakeholders and partners that have never had to deal with wolves before. And so these are people who you know, are already worried about getting wolves in the first place, and then they'd be getting these wolves that require a lot of work to get them to kind of rewild. Um, <clears throat> it's not our best foot forward, right? It's for, and this is unfortunate, but for a species where public perception matters as much as it does, it's just not kind of politically pal palatable right now for us to be able to do that. Um, luckily, <clears throat> we came up with the idea that pup fostering could help us get there. Um, this is the idea of taking five to 15 day old puppies. These are the genetically valuable puppies that are born in captivity. And we take them and we, from wherever they're born, New York, here, anywhere, and we take them into the recovery area and we insert them into a wild den of similarly aged pups. And then they are raised in the wild by experienced wolves. So it still allows us to get that gene diversity into the wild population. We're not expanding any area where wolves are, right? <clears throat> these are existing dens. And these dens exist in areas where we already have relationships with the stakeholders or the livestock producers and stuff. So we're effectively just increasing the litter size of that wild litter and completely removing the nuisance issues that are, or the nuisance issues that are associated with getting adult wolves out into the wild. Um, <clears throat> there's been some skepticism on how well this is going to work, ourselves included, um, and we've now done enough to really start looking at the data to see if it is working. We've moved 83 captive-born pups into wild dens. Um, what's the best way to say this? So uh, natural pup mortality, so for wild-born pups, only 50% of them survive the first year. And we, we talk about surviving to breeding age, that's age two. And so with first year mortality and second year mortality for wild born pups, only 34% of them make it to age two. It's kind of sad, but wolves seem to do fine with it. But <clears throat> so 34% of wild born pups on average make it to age two. And what we've documented with our fostered pups is that 28% of them have made it to age two. And that's a minimum, right? Because we're putting these guys in at five to 15 days old. We might trap uh, in that area for the, uh, you know, to try to collar or try to document these wolves in the summer and the fall. Um, but th that's just based on the number of those animals that we're recapturing or re-documenting in the wild. And we know we're not getting 100% of them, right? So 28% documented versus 34% expected is pretty good. So we're pretty excited with the success rate of this. Um, 13 of, more than 13 probably, at least 13 have survived to breeding age. Uh, a lot of people don't like that metric, just surviving to breeding age. They want them to survive and also reproduce in the wild, which makes sense. I mean, are you contributing to the population if you're just living in it, or do you have to you know, produce offspring in it? There's whole arguments either way. But seven of those 13 that have survived to breeding age, and that number will go up this year, Seven have produced pups. Um, some of them have produced more than one litter they've produced in a couple of years. So we're pretty excited with the success of this program. Um, and I can talk ad nauseum about how important this facility has been to the success of that program. And maybe we'll do that afterwards. But uh, I only like to show this to kind of show we lost, and this sort of ties in with what the Red Wolf program is really battling right now, getting, getting support to start doing something you stopped doing it's really challenging, right? So we stopped doing releases and we knew we needed, you know, when we were coming up with recovery criteria for the species and we worked on our recovery plan from 2010 and it finally published in 2017. And the biggest challenge to it was we knew we needed to continue to put wolves into the wild from the captive population. And that's just not a widely supported thing. Like, why would you do that when your population's growing fine? You know, so that was part of the reason why it took us so long to get the recovery plan out the door. Um, but pup fostering really made it possible for us to start having that conversation again, right? Start making sure that the genetics of the species was really, everybody believed it was really important, but nobody wanted to do the thing that we needed to do to fix it, so. <clears throat> um, that is a picture of wolf tracks. <laughs> there's supposed to be, okay. I'm like, there's supposed to be, <laughs> supposed to be something on there. Um, <clears throat> 
about half of our population is radio collared, which is really, really high. A lot of wild populations that are monitored or populations that are monitored in the wild have, you know, our goal is I think two radio collars per pack and we way exceed that. Part of that's because of pup fostering, right? We're trying to document the survival of these pups, so we're trapping after the packs that we foster into. And anything we catch, we put a collar on, because why not? Um, <clears throat> so a lot of that is, or at least at this point, a lot of that's because of that. But 50% of our population being radio collared is really high. And we use um, radio collars that have both the VHF, the handheld telemetry you know, signal thing, and as well as GPS. So we can see where they are on our computer and we can go out on the ground and see where they are you know in in real time um, <clears throat> this is kind of a zoomed out view of where the packs kind of are using right now um, prior to the 2015 rule all of these wolves would have been removed that wolf we don't know what the heck she's doing um, <clears throat> She's even way far, this is a great time, I love this time of year, right, because it's right before breeding season, so wolves are doing nutso things. Like these, oh, I didn't, I should have taken a, if we had a wolf that went all the way over here and then came back, they're just doing these really wide-ranging dispersal movements where they shoot out like one or two hundred miles and then they come right back. She's not, I don't know where she's going, um, <clears throat> but, what's that? But, but yeah, now, now she's... Do you guys, uh, maybe nobody knows, but the, there was a big fire in near Mora, New Mexico, and she's up there. So she's, 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 she's going somewhere. I don't know what she's doing. But <clears throat> you can see kind of how they're using the landscape and, dis and moving about. But when you zoom in on it, you can really see how much the packs are butting up against each other. Th this is, I think, seven days of worth of locations on some of them, not even all the radio colors. I just picked one color per pack. Um, but so this is seven days worth of locations and you can see, I mean, they're, they're running into each other, right? They're interacting with each other. They're, they're, you know, maintaining territories and stuff. But this kind of thing is really interesting to me. It's like, I thought wolves killed each other when they, you know, got side by side. But our, our population, I don't know if it's not as densely populated as it needs to be. I think there's enough prey in the area that they're not fighting for food, right? So they do kind of all intermingle like this. I mean, these, these are territories. It's not like, you know, this wolf can just come over here and hang out, but obviously they, they knew each other were there that day, right? Um, <clears throat> so I don't know, I think it's interesting. Some people have said, maybe it's because Mexican wolves are all related and they all know their family that they're, <laughs> they're not finding, I don't know. <clears throat> um, all right, we hit the news for this reason. We do <laughs> remove wolves and Oh, how much do I want to talk about this? Um, this, the gray shade is removals for going outside the boundary, and that will become less and less of a percentage of the removals. This is total removals through time, so it includes when we had that smaller recovery area. So the gray shade is big because we removed a lot of wolves because we were going and bringing them back all the time. So that'll get smaller. Um, <clears throat> the nuisance removals, that will also get smaller because we're not releasing adult wolves that are causing that nuisance behavior. So that will get smaller. but. By and large, the point to make here is that livestock is the number one reason why we're picking up wolves and moving them or removing them. Um, I'm like, there's supposed to be another graph here. Um, <clears throat> so this is what it looks like. The blue sliver is our lethal control. So that's when we go out and we lethally control a wolf. That's what everybody hears about in the news. Um, but you can see by and large, most of the wolves that we're removing um, we're still having contribute to recovery in some way or another. So the orange section, the biggest one, is that's when we're translocating it to another spot in our recovery area. So we're just picking it up and moving it. Not a good place for you, good place for you. The gray one is we're picking it up and moving it to Mexico. We're taking it from our population and we're giving it to Mexico. Um, that, that'll get bigger, I think, as we go through time. And then the yellowish is we're picking it up and we're taking it back to captivity because it has valuable to the it has value to the captive breeding program. Um, so we aren't doing a lot of lethal removals, but it is what you know compared to the other sources of removals. But it is what hits the news. Um, and then mortalities is always something that someone asks about. Uh, who? What do you think kills the most wolves? <laughs> I mean, the graph is pretty, it's, it's pretty blatant, right? Illegal mortality is the number one source of wolf mortality. And that's just from 
documented. But those are usually radio collared wolves that we can go out and document and find the carcass. So uncollared wolves, we generally don't document what's causing their death. So the other things could be higher, but generally, since half of our population is radio collared, um, I think this is a pretty adequate representation of what they're, what they're all dying from. So. All time, 98 through, yeah, 98 through now, so. <clears throat> all right, so another population is Mexico. Um, Mexico looked at six different release, this is really funny. Mexico looked at six different release sites. You can see them on that map. They're actually using the area between one and two. <laughs> um, they did start releasing wolves in the first area, and I think I, I think I have it on the next slide. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk about some of the challenges they found in that area, but then they moved their reintroduction site to actually the area between one and two. Um, you can see their population is in that early phase of like the bouncing around. Um, the number of releases is that yellow line. And <clears throat> unfortunately for Mexico, this is, I haven't done a statistical analysis on this, so I'm going out on a limb and saying that this is because they have funding, they don't have funding. They have funding, they don't have funding. Um, their funding cycle is very different from ours. Um, not only do they have funding in different years, they also have funding during certain times of the year. So it makes doing field work year round really challenging. Um, but it is, you can see that they're trying in the years that they have money, right? They are trying to get a population established and the wolves are, are starting to get there. They're, kind of generally around 30 to 40 wolves right now, um, even with this erratic release strategy. Um, some things though that are really challenging in Mexico that we don't experience in our recovery program in the US is that the bulk, these are those release sites that they analyze, the black things, and this is actually the area they're using. They started in the Northern area <clears throat> um, had some problems there with the use of poisons. Um, but the biggest challenge they have with this, this map on the right, is most of the land in Mexico, most being like all, is private land. And so in order for them to release wolves, they have to have a landowner agreement plus the neighboring landowners. And it's really hard to get people, especially when they are running cattle or other livestock, you know, getting them to agree to release wolves. So that's partly why they have that erratic releases is once they get a landowner's approval, they're like, 20 wolves, you get all 20 of them, you know? <clears throat> um, that's not really true, but it kind of. Uh, but so that's a significant challenge that we don't have. We are very lucky that we're dealing with large swaths of federal land in Arizona and New Mexico. I mean, it's multi-use, right? We do have livestock conflicts, but private land is a, is a challenge for Mexico. Um, I talked about it a little bit, but the use of poisons is also a big challenge. And that's why they stopped using that northern recovery area is I think every wolf that we released over a couple of years very quickly died from ingesting poison. So um, they moved it further south where that's not as rampant. The other challenge that we have in Mexico is that wolves like forested environments away from people and so do drug traffickers and things like that. So. A lot of times when the wolves move into these forested lands, you know, they'll release, I'm making things up, I don't actually know where the drug cartels are, but say, <laughs> say they're releasing wolves into this area, you know, the more, that might not be the greatest habitat and the wolves move up into this area, well, that's where a lot of the drug trafficking is. And so <clears throat> there's not, the wolves are wearing collars and they don't seem to, there's not a high mortality risk for them when they move into those areas, it doesn't seem, but there's no ability to follow up on monitoring them. So when they have pups the next year, there's no trapping, there's no radio calling, there's no telling what's happening with those packs, you know, or all we know is that they're pairs. Um, so that's a bit challenging. So when you ask Mexico how many wolves they have, they're like 10 to 50, you know, and you, you know, just depends. So it, that's just things that we don't deal with in the United States and it's very challenging for them in Mexico. All right, one of my favorite aspects of the program nobody ever talks about, and I'm excited because I get to talk about it a little bit here because you guys are intimately involved in this, but um, we have a biobanked population, right? A frozen zoo population and uh, two, three pretty significant partners. We have the University of New Mexico <clears throat> and the St. Louis Zoo and the Chapultepec Zoo in Mexico. Um, luckily, I can talk about it right now. Um, <clears throat> luckily, the, isn't that cute? 
I know I'm surprised the puppy picture didn't get a whole bunch of aww. You guys are being polite. Um, one of the huge contributions that, you know, I call this the mecca of wolf recovery, that um, this area has made to Mexican wolf recovery has been the foresight of some of the folks that have worked here and have worked at the St. Louis Zoo like in the 80s and the 90s. Um, the folks at the St. Louis Zoo approached the Fish and Wildlife Service in like 1990. You know, this is before we even put wolves on the ground. It was when we were still thinking like, can we even do that? You know, and they said, you guys should really allow us to start a gamete bank for you guys. Let us collect semen and oocytes because, you know, we, we might need them someday because the situation is so dire, right? We might need them someday. Um, and I look at what the Fish and Wildlife <laughs> Service is doing now, right? We cloned a ferret and now everybody is excited about this frozen zoo idea. And our program, the Mexican wolf program, is being used as sort of a model for how it should be done, and we had no idea we were doing it right, right? When we started the captive breeding program and the binational stuff, like a lot of papers are in kind of prep right now that keep citing to the Mexican wolf program because we started a gamete bank in the 90s knowing that we had no idea how to use it. We didn't have artificial insemination techniques or procedures even for dogs really at the time, but the folks at the St. Louis Zoo were like, but you might someday, and you can't go back and collect them later. Um, so luckily, I think there were a lot of visionary people at, at the Endangered Wolf Center and the St. Louis Zoo that really helped get this going far before we ever even had an idea that we could use it. And now we're getting really close to being able to, well, we're getting, we have used it and you guys actually have here. We've been successful with fresh semen artificial insemination enough to know we think we could do it that doesn't exactly help bring a wolf back from the dead, right? If we're banking animals in the, in the biobank, then far beyond its living lifespan, it can breed you know, another wolf in the wild. We can do artificial insemination and get pups from that animal far beyond its lifespan. But we have a bank full of frozen semen and we can do fresh AI, you know, fresh semen AI, and we've been trying to figure out ways to do the frozen semen AI, and you guys actually here, I'm sure you guys all know this, you guys actually have the one and only wolf pup that's, well, he's not a pup anymore, but pup that's been produced through frozen semen, and that gives us huge hope for the potential use of this bank into the future. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, I'm completely skipping UNM because I'm so excited about it. UNM, we deposit all of our carcasses there and they're used for research and it's great. No, I'm just kidding. They have an extensive blood bank and it is used for a lot of research stuff, but this is obviously the part that I'm really excited about. Um, Karen at the St. Louis Zoo did correct me, it's all males greater than four years old now have been banked. Um, and all females, all, I don't know if it's all, but, <clears throat> um, significant number of the living population in captivity has been banked in our biobank. And this is really important because we hope to never need it for this reason. But if something happens to either the living populations, right, the wild population or the captive population, we have the hope or the ability potentially of being able to restore it by using the gamete bank. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, that's sort of worst case scenario. But best case scenario is once we get better at the assisted reproductive technologies, we can actually start using the bank to, you know, I talked about how bad our gene diversity issue is, but we'll be able to start using the bank to not just slow the loss of gene diversity, but actually maybe bring back some of the gene diversity that has been lost. Um, because folks here and folks at the St. Louis Zoo started this way back in the, you know, early 90s, we have a lot of, oh, that was so close. We have a lot of genetics that are in the, in the biobank, but not in the living population. So I'm pretty excited about this. I don't know if you can tell. Um, <clears throat> but this is one of the reasons why I say it's really hard to give a one hour lo uh, long talk about Mexican wolf recovery because we have so many different like integrated parts of recovery. We aren't lucky enough to just say, we got some wolves in the wild, they're growing, they're doing fine. It would be great, right? I do think that of the 200 wolves that we have in the wild right now, if we walked away, I do think that that population would continue growing and it would be fine. Um, the challenge that we have is that we don't know if we have adequate genetics in the wild population. You never know until it's too late, right? You never know until something happens. And so there's no reason to just wipe our hands and say, good luck, when we know we can do better. So that's why all three of these populations are still kind of intertied, intermingled, um, and we do great conservation work between all the groups, and it's really exciting. So I think that's it. 
Um, this is so fun. So this is one of our food caches. And he's taking a nap. That bear, that bear was on the food cache for like more than an hour, and this wolf came like three or four times, like, oh darn it, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, but that bear was asleep for a really long time on the food cache. Mm -hmm. 